so welcome back uh -huh. and this is the fourth session and the last session and i guess it is one of the most interesting sessions uh, it will be one of the most interesting sessions so it is upon epidemiology and uh, there are three speakers and each speaker will talk about uh, how uh, how infectious disease spread and especially touch upon covid and i guess uh, what I talked there will be experience from three different continents from the South America, from USA and from um, India. Uh, three hotspots uh, and we'll have discussions on that. So the first speaker is uh, Professor Fernando Perwani and for Professor Fernando Perwani is uh, a professor at Paris Karchi University. University. And he studied uh, physics at Buenos, uh, University of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and then did his PhD from Max Planck uh, Institute for Physics of Complex System, Germany. So over to you, Fernando. Okay. Sorry. Very exciting talk. We are looking forward for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I will try to share. Um, let me know if it's working. Uh, up. You yes. see my slides? Yes. Let's see. Okay, very good. So thank you, Niloy. Thank you all, the organizer, for the invitation. Um, my talk would be a bit um, theoretical, but though has been, I mean, it, there is a clear relation with the COVID. Well, this is, is we try to develop models to, to understand few aspects of this um, Spreading, spreading of diseases, but in particular those where uh, close contact between people or agents could lead to, to the propagation of uh, a disease. So let me let me start. Um, modeling effort have focused on the large scale spreading of, of I mean in the large scale spreading of epidemics, meaning that at least for the last I would say 15 years or even 20 years, the effort has been put on how to detect when um, like the COVID, a virus emerged somewhere and uh, spreads over the world. Other kind of models also focus in larger scales, but uh, perhaps not at the global scale, but uh, at the level of a country and things like that. Now, if you um, please tell me if, if there is a problem with the with the sound or with the slides. So, so, so far everything is okay. Everything is okay. Fine. Okay, so so you, I, I will need some some feedback to, from mm -hmm. time to time. Okay, so now if you think at um, this type of questions, I mean how how if a virus that started somewhere, for instance in China, and managed to to go to Europe, South America, everywhere. Clearly, it's important to take into account this, uh, for example, deadline transportation network. I mean, large scale transportation network that nowadays we use. And it seems like a very adapted tool to look at this kind of problems, how, how that occurs is the use of complex networks. That's, that's more or less what I would say is, is standard nowadays. I mean, everybody understands that the, that's very important and that's the way of, of going to, to model this kind of uh, phenomenon. At the same time, there is something that has very has not been much explored and uh, is, is what is the focus of this talk and, and some of my research. That is what happens not when you take the airplane and so on, but what happens when you, you end up uh, at the airport and you start moving around? What happens uh, when, when people are moving in the street or you are uh, in a mall? So basically my question is, is how that small scale motion, human motion if you want, but motion in general in the context of epidemics models affect the spreading? And which kind of tools can we use to understand that? So, and, and I will try to convince you that the way of going to understand this is, is not using uh, complex networks, but uh, using uh, agent-based uh, models where the agents move in space. Okay, so let me 
let me start by by telling you what uh, well, I guess that most of you know that is the models I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about the SIR model. This is a model where if you have an agent that is uh, susceptible, can get infected, transition to another state, state I infected, and from the uh, the state I may transition to the state R recover. So now there is something special. The, the transition from susceptible to infected that can occur spontaneously that needs, I mean, two agents to be in contact that that let me interpret it like that at physical contact or, or at the metric uh, distance and a short distance one from the other. And in that case, we can define a probability per time unit that the susceptible agent becomes infected. So as you can see here, I, I'm, I'm making a difference between what is this parameter alpha, this probability per time unit, once two agents are in contact uh, of becoming infected with the, the uh, letter I put here. Because this letter implies that the transition is possible, but I have to know what is the alpha, but I also need to know how often I'm going to be in contact eventually with an infected agent. Okay, the other model I'm going to talk about is the SIRS. So this is basically the same model as before with the only difference is that from recover we can go from to susceptible. And again has the same feature as the previous one. Two agents need to be in, in close contact or close distance in order to get the, the disease. Okay, so let me now go into, into what I, I, I want to discuss. Here I'm calling support. I mean that now is going to hope actually going to become clear in a second. So suppose that you have the system of I mean this kind of dynamics I'm showing you here. You start with uh, suppose um, a system of agents in a state S, and now you start to transition them to the different states. So how can you play that game? So you could imagine that you put all the agents on a lattice, you could put your agents on a network, or you can go in what I call here classical mean field models or well-mixed populations. So let's see a bit of each of them. If I go to a lattice, what I do is I put all the agents uh, on, an, I mean, on a regular lattice. Now I inoculate the disease in one of them, and then I'm going to assume that nearest neighbors or first nearest and second nearest neighbors, that depends how, how you want to define it, but the, the lattice in itself will provide us who is the neighbor of uh, each agent. And if we find a pair of them that are red and, and, and green, as here, you, you, you play these dynamics with this probability per time unit alpha, you will um, transform or make one of these susceptible agents become infected, like in here, for example. So in that case, that was the entire ring that I assumed that was getting infected. If you have a network, something similar happens. So you start with one infected, and then you use the network to indicate who are the ones that are in contact with you, with the, with the focus uh, agent that we started with, and, and then the, the disease propagate through that uh, structure that network. This is, this is what I'm calling the support on which, uh, I mean, on top of which we are playing these dynamics. Okay, so there is something that is important to notice. The first one is that in the lattice and the network color correlations are important. So be, what, what I mean by that, if I pick up one, one red agent and I ask myself, where is the next red agent, the red agent has to be connected most probably is, is, is in, in near distance from the one that I pick up. So there's strong correlations in space. On the network, that is, those correlations are given by the, the topology of the network, of the underlying network. And since this network not, may not be as ordered, those correlations are less important. That's why I put this arrow in correlation that the most correlated, I would say, are the lattice models an intermediate case would be the networks, and this well-mixed population is the, the one extreme in which we assume that there is no correlation at all in the system. 
Okay, so now coming, I mean, continuing with this comparison, when you see what happens on, on, a, on the lattice, on the lattice you can even observe propagating waves. This is what you are seeing here. And in fact, we started with one, we have this, uh, this ring around that is red. And if we continue, we will see expanding from this center a wave that would uh, uh, propagate outward um, and, and cover, I mean, at an advanced propagate through the system. So the dynamics on a lattice can be described, and that this is something important with reaction diffusion equations, and that, I mean, even before the 2000s, um, that, that has been used to, for example, explain the spread of the bubonic plague in, in Europe. And if you use um, reaction diffusion equations, that is a way of implementing this lattice kind of dynamics, what you can, what people have done is to measure the speed of the wave in, of the plague through Europe. And, and similar kind of studies have been used, uh, have been also implemented for, for other diseases. Okay, now something, another thing to, to consider is that if you look at the I mean, this, this, um, for example, the SIR, SIS model, SIRS model, and so on, they have a, a critical point. And if you look at the dynamics of the system close to the critical point, you will see that the scaling of how the disease, um, I mean, the, the, the scaling properties of the disease spreading process is very different. You have different critical exponents depending whether you are on a lattice or you are in a well mixed population or if you are on a network. So that, that's, um, I mean, the message is that the topology of the support plays a fundamental role in disease spreading. Okay, so now some, some comments on what we have been, I mean, what I mentioned of well mixed populations. If you have well mixed populations, typically uh, the, this is something that, uh, I mean, that we have discussed is that if we have a pair of patients, one S and one I, there is a probability per time unit. We, we may, I mean, implement this, this uh, reaction or this transition that is the susceptible become infected. But you have to define uh, the, which pairs of particles do you pick? Basically, one has to define a, a frequency at which we will be picking up from the, this well-mixed population pairs. And this is what we will need to construct this prob effective probability of transition of a given susceptible agent of becoming infected. Now, all that, that I mean, basically the, there is some several assumptions that you, I mean, that are difficult to interpret if you go into a mean field uh, for the, for example, the SIR model. So basically what, what would be the interpretation of this transition? That, that's uh, less, I mean, it's a bit more evident if you have uh, an underlying structure like a lattice or a network, because in, in, in here, as we discussed a bit before, pairs are given by, by the structure, and the only thing that you have to do is, is basically compute whenever you find a pair of red and, and green, if, they, 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 if the green one becomes red. So that's, that's basically a comment that will be relevant for the, for the, in, in the next part of the talk. Okay, so there is something else. You can have a network, and that network could be a dynamical network in the sense that you may have the links that um, basically nodes may get connected and disconnected over time. And, and however, if you play the, the same game that we started to discuss before, meaning that you inoculate the disease in one of the, the nodes, then what you will see is that, um, I mean, you can propagate the disease that is going to depend obviously on the rate at which these links are connected and, and uh, basically on the dynamics of the links, but the propagation has to be, I mean, a subset of the underlying network. Basically, what, if, I, if I take all my red nodes, they will be in a subset of the, the initial network we started, uh, uh, we, we, we were playing with initially. So the, 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 the aggregated network, static one, let's say, that has all links, 
that one, I mean, is the one that contains all possible trees. So that means that the disease spreading properties strongly depend on the characteristics of this network. Okay, <clears throat> so basically all this discussion was to tell you that mm, there are at least classical three, what I'm calling here support. You can play the game on a lattice, on a network, on a well mixed population and the question is is uh, if there is an alternative to this i mean if that if there is something else and the answer is yes for example one option is to look at uh, systems of moving agents these agents are moving in space or one of them at the beginning or few of them were red meaning infected and then they started to interact and the disease started to spread over the system now what i want to focus and this is um, is that uh, this we were proposing this 10 years before the COVID and back then the people were not very happy um, of calling this that was uh, related to epidemic models and the, for example the title of that paper is dynamics and steady state an excitable mobile agent system but the original title that we put but the uh, referees and editors suggested us to change it was epidemic dynamics and endemic state in mobile agent system. So before the COVID, trying to sell this as relevant for this disease spreading was very, very difficult. But I think uh, now with the COVID this uh, has changed, or at least I hope. Um, okay, so let's let's see a bit, um, oh sorry, how, how this works. Um, if you have one of these models, um, an, a moving agent model, what you need to do, with the input that you give to the model is the be behavioral rules or equation of motion for the agents. Once you have provided those rules, the, those rules will, will generate for you a spatial dynamics. The agents will start moving in space and that will give you, I mean, this is the output of the model, the dynamics of, of the contacts. So now you will start getting a temporal dynamics of whom is getting in contact with whom over time. And, and, and so that's, that's in, I mean, it's very different from typically what people do. Typically what they do is either they assume a social dynamics or they take it, I mean, the, the dynamics of contact typically is an input. But here, as you see, is an output. So what we are trying to get, if you want, is given a behavioral rule or equation of motion, what would be the dynamic of contacts? And if you have the dynamics of contacts, we want to see how, how that affects the, the spreading of a disease. So basically the question is, is, is that we want to relate behavior in space with dynamic of contacts and, and this being translated in the dynamics of the epidemics. So which kind of behavioral rules one can use? There are in fact uh, a super large number of options here. Uh, here I'm showing you some of the systems I have been uh, working on in the past. For example, here is very similar, the first example to this one. What you have is self-propelled objects, objects that move without, if there is no collision at constant speed in space and interactions are only due to volume exclusion, that is the, the objects push each other. So, but what I want to show you here is that are there are different dynamic phases in space that can have a strong impact on the dynamics of, uh, of a disease. For instance, in this kind of systems, what you can observe is that they can if the density is high enough, I mean, in some, some limits, you can see the formation of this kind of aggregate. If now you make the object a bit more elongated, you can get this kind of turbulent phases. Um, now, if you make it uh, more elongated, you can get basically um, stripes, so basically like a, a people walking a line in, in one direction, and then you can have things that are a bit more uh, complex or different from, from what, I mean, we have seen so far. And there is also another option is to use flocking models. For example, this is uh, what I'm showing you. This is uh, a flock and, and there's objects that this uh, black 
uh, agents will try to avoid as they move in space. They are moving in the same direction and you can also play that game by putting them uh, in a box, for example. So you can play all kinds of games of this sort, at least theoretically, but clearly the goal is to go into something of the, I mean, more realistic. If you want to apply this to understand how is the spreading, I mean, in a realistic context, and that would be, for example, plugging in as behavioral rules the dynamics of, of pedestrians using, for example, a pedestrian model. That, and that is something that we are doing at the moment. OK, so now I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about the, the results that uh, we have obtained over the, over the years, and I think that are relevant. So the first model I'm going to talk about was the one that you saw in that um, video at the very beginning. So what you have there is self-propelled disk. This disk, the motility pattern, the dynamics in space is often called run and tumble. That means they move in a straight line and from time to time they will change direction and interaction and only due to volume exclusion. Now, if you look at the equation of motion, it's very simple. What you have is that the agent will move in a given direction. This, the direction of fi is given by uh, by a given value, so it's a, it's a vector, and we are going to change that vector at Poissonian given time. From time to time, then what you what we do is we change this direction of f, and we keep on using an interaction that whenever they come close to each other, two of these disks, they will repel each other and they cannot cross over each other. That's that's all they do. And this, if if you put that, you will obtain the dynamics we have seen before. That I mean this. Um, Sorry, this, you will see this kind of dynamics. OK, so now let me go uh, continue. Um, with this, what you can see, what the dynamics we have uh, looked at is the SIRS that we have discussed before. So here we have uh, two parameters for the three, in fact, for the um, disease, that is to i, that is the characteristic time an agent remains infective, to R, the characteristic time it takes from recover to susceptible, and to T, that is the, the time that if they are in contact, physical contact here, because of the, in the model they can, as you have seen here, they can interact, they can collide, they can be in physical contact. Once they are in physical, oh sorry, if they are in, oh my God, <laughs> sorry. If they are in physical contact, there is a characteristic time to T that they can get the disease. OK, now if you put these uh, particles move in space, what you can use in order to understand what is the contact rate in the system is to assume that if they have a velocity V, you can use kinetic theory of gases and estimate with which frequency an infected agent will encounter susceptible agent per time unit. And that, if you want, this this thing in here will characterize the would be the equivalent to the degree of of, an, of a dynamical network. Okay, now that you have that, we we have to take into account that there is this time the two agents are in contact is also given by the dynamic in space. So basically, it's what is written here: two interacted agents remain in contact for a for a given time, that time is a stochastic variable, and that the stochastic variable is given by the dynamics in the space of this agent. And let's call omega the average contact time per average contact time per contact. That means whenever two of two agents meet, how often for how long they stay in contact. Okay, now if you do that, what you can do is this is the standard mean field for the SIRS dynamics. So you have typically these quantities beta, gamma, and so on are a constant. But here what we are going to do is we are going to replace or write these uh, constants as function of parameters that are related to the dynamics in the space of the agents. And this is what I'm showing you here. That's why you have this more complicated expression. Now, this, what tells you is, is that the, the dynamics in space will give us the frequency of contacts, and this part in here takes into account the average 
contact time and how effectively is a contact on transmitted disease. Now, what the, the, the message of, from this is that you can then redefine the basic reproductive number, basically, which, uh, which will tell you whether you can propagate if you will go to an endemic state or not. And, and that becomes, you can express it in this way, and this can be written in the motility parameters in the system. And what is important is that this quantity, lambda and the average k, are not independent because omega, that is the contact time, also depends on v. So these two are not independent. Okay, so now some, some observations. If you have this system, what you can do is you can basically change the density or change the size of the box, and then happens the following. If you are mm, very diluted, um, the system is very large, and, um, and they don't form clusters and so on, these agents, you will describe what happens in space um, with, with the modified mean field theory I, I showed to you before. Now, as you keep on increasing, the, you, you compress the system and the density increases, the system will, will start going into these symbols that I put here that correspond to what you would expect for a lattice. And this would be at the maximum density. So there is a bit, um, well, this is some, some, some limits that you can compute, that's not very relevant. What is important is that as you try to go towards the lattice limit, I mean, this high density limit I'm putting here, you will see that there is a strong deviation with respect of the mean field, modified mean field theory I showed you before. And this is because in the system cluster with the merge, this is the cluster size, and this is the probability of observing a given cluster size. And as you see, as, you, as the, the system becomes smaller and the density increases, you, you, you start to move, I mean, the cluster size distribution is, is affected. And that leads to deviation from, from the mean field theory. Now, what is important to understand, okay, this is, this is something else, this is the dependency uh, with, with the speed, and this is controlled pretty much on, on the value of tau t. And, and this is what tells you, basically, a, again, that dependency with, um, with v of the, for example, the, these dots are the number of susceptible agents, so if the speed is very uh, low, basically this, you cannot propagate the disease, you start to use a larger speed, and at some point the, the number of susceptible agents start to decrease, and start to decrease, I mean, becomes a function, a well-defined function of the, of the speed V of the agents. And there is a critical, I mean, a crossover speed that leads you to another regime. So there is a non-trivial behavior of the endemic state with, with the velocity of the agents. Okay, so, but from this part, I think the, the most relevant thing to, to remember is that the, the, this simple model I'm showing you um, bridges to two type of models that we are used to look at, I mean, to, to work with, that are the lattice models and well-mixed populations. If you are at high density, you have something like a solid, basically the agents cannot move away and they are more or less trapped in a kind of a, a lattice, and you get a behavior that not surprisingly behaves pretty much as what you would expect for a lattice. As you start to dilute the system, and if the speed is large enough and some other um, features that need to be fulfilled, then you will observe a behavior, mainly a low density, that uh, is, is consistent to well-mixed populations. And that means that with these models, you can go from this lattice behavior to well-mixed populations, and in between, you have a behavior that resembles that that you would observe in a dynamical network, though this model this agent system can never be reduced to a standard dynamic network, and, and we may discuss that later. Okay, now something else. Um, there are two regimes that are very important for this kind of systems, and that is that you can, this, what you see is the number of 
susceptible agents, here it's written like raw S, um, as as function of V, V naught, now before was V, now is V naught, sorry for that, but this is the same quantity, so the uh, active speed of the agents, what you can see is that there are different kind of regimes depending of this lambda. Uh, now, what is this lambda? This lambda tells you how often this agent change uh, the current moving direction. So if this lambda um, would be zero, that means that they 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 never change um, direction. And, and in that limit, what you would expect basically is that the agents will move in a, um, the collisions will be ballistic in the sense that the probability that if I start with a red agent and a blue agent that to meet is um, the time to, to the, they will encounter is, is not proportional to T square. That would be the case if they are in a diffusive regime. Now, when they are in a diffusive regime, they are in a diffusive regime if before uh, meeting, they have turned many times. If that ha has happened, we can use a diffusive kind of limit to compute the average time they need to meet. And all that translates into by looking at V as function of lambda, you can see that there is a threshold between what I'm calling here the active phase, which is the endemic phase, and the phase where there is no propagation of the disease. And, and this depends pretty much on these two variables, V and, and lambda. So this, this, um, this is the frontier between uh, these two phases. So I, I don't know if how clear is this, but this depends pretty much on how is how is the behavior of the, the particles um, if they meet ballistically, meaning without changing the moving direction, or if they meet after changing many times the, the moving direction, and if if that that leads to different regimes. And remember that we are interested in understanding how motion in space affects the spreading of a disease. Okay, now I move to, to um, the SIR model, and this was a simulation done by Benjamin Marco Longo. Um, here what you have is an SIR dynamics, so it's what you can see here in the movie, and it's again, you have disk, and this disk uh, interact when they collide, and, and that's it. Okay, so the question we will use now the model to ask ourselves how much how how much we can forecast the evolution of an epidemics, at least in the context of these models, and and here you have a system where all agents move at the same speed, and what the different curves the different colors correspond to different velocities in the of the population. So where agents are moving either at velocity 0 0.1, 0 0.08, and so on. Um, and, and here what you see is the, the probability of observing a given epidemic size for, I mean, simulations where the initial condition and all parameters are fixed. And what is varying, which is the color, is the velocity. Here what you see is at which point, they, I mean, which maximum uh, infection they reach. Here what you see is the extinction time, meaning how long you have to wait till nobody is infected in the system and you have only or either susceptible or a recovered agents. And, and this is the, the at which time the peak, the maximum has occurred. So basically the kind of question that people were asking with the COVID. So, but where did the fluctuations come from? That comes from because the dynamics in space is, is, I mean, even if we start from the same initial condition, there will be different realization of the noise and the, the encounters that they will occur between the particles are different. And that leads to this uh, dispersion in the values that you obtain for the epidemic size, the, the, the epidemic peak, the extinction time, and so on. Now what you can do something else, okay, with that what you can see if you if you look at the velocity is that there is a transition as similar to the one that we were talking before. If the velocity um, is very small, basically 
if you inoculate one or few agents, they will not manage to propagate the disease, but if the velocity is larger, you will basically manage to propagate the disease to the entire system. Okay, now what you can see here is I'm, I'm comparing these quantities, epidemic size, epidemic peak, extinction time, and peak time, with um, for for distributions of the speed, now the population is heterogeneous, but this, all, all these curves have the same average speed and then have the same average degree, if you want, I mean, of the aggregated network. And basically, they should share the same uh, R0, the basic reproduction number. So though they, they have the same number in principle, what you can see is that the, the difference in behavior, the dispersion in epidemic size, epidemic peak, extinction time, and so on, is, is significant. And the reason is that though the average is, is the same, the, the variance of this quantity is not. And that is why you see such a dispersion. So we are trying to understand what are the sources of fluctuations in, in this kind of system. And because of that, because now you have different type of distributions, you can play a game that if you have been working on complex networks and epidemics may uh, ring a bell, this is that you can play a random immunization strategy, meaning you pick up, for example, 10, 20 or 30 percent of the agents and, and you vaccinate them and you see that the, uh, the more you vaccinate, the, epide the average epidemic size gets reduced. Um, and, and here what you see is that you can do a selected immunization. Here what we do is we, we start by vaccinating those that move faster. And if you do that, you get a much significant decrease uh, of the epidemics that you would do. I mean, in, in both cases, you may be reducing um, the same number of, of agents, but here you are selecting which one you want to vaccinate first. So if you vac vaccinate the fastest, you get the better result. And here is, is in fact what we were doing lately and, and was the, is probably the most interesting result, is whether vaccination can decrease the number of infection, which is what everybody assumes. And here you can see with this uh, very simple model uh, what happens. Here what I'm showing you is uh, the number of agents that uh, have been uh, vaccinated uh, this is with the type anyway, so that has been vaccinated. And this is the epidemic size, it's a small system uh, where we have done this. I mean, and but, but you can do it in, in larger system and this the behavior that we are going to discuss remain the same. So what you are seeing here is that in, in all these simulations, every data point here corresponds to a simulation that is identical to the to the previous one. All of them are identical. The only things that is being different is the number of agents that are vaccinated at time zero. But each of them have the same initial condition and the dynamic of space is, uh, is always the same. So everything is basically deterministic, even the disease is deterministic in the sense that here we are fixing the time an infected agent remains infected and we are fixing as well that whenever two agents, one infected, and one susceptible get in contact, the, the, the susceptible one will get with probability one the disease. And because here we are using like a kind machine in the sense that you can compare what happens with the situation with 20, um, 20 agents that have been vaccinated. And now what you do in the next one, you, you will reproduce exactly everything is the same. You start with the same position of the agents they will move in a space as previously we have done, with, we have done in, for this data point. And so everything will be identical. The only difference is that now there is few more vaccinated agents. So we have the same ones, the same 20 that were vaccinated here, plus let's say five more that we added. You add these five more, and instead of decreasing, the epidemic size increases a bit. But you can see that this can be quite significant. And if you start from a different set of conditions and dynamics in space, so these three figures are just a bit random, taking these different initial conditions and 
three different dynamics in space. Again, the only difference between one and the other is that we have been increasing the number of people vaccinated. As you can see, is that typically goes down, but often it goes uh, up again. So basically, the message here is that um, vaccination does, oh, you know what, we were a bit surprised. We were assuming that the more you vaccinate, the epidemic size has to always and systematically go down. And if, if it goes up, that should be because we have done a different temporal dynamics. I mean, if we do launch the, the I mean, random numbers, and the dynamics is random, so we have always fluctuation, then can go up and down and so on, so you, we can observe fluctuation. But if we go in a deterministic kind of dynamics that this one, we were expecting that the more you vaccinate, less number of infections occur in the system. But this is not the case. And the message is only this is true that the vaccination decreases the number of, of uh, infected agents in average. If you perform many uh, realizations of this, you will see that in average, vaccination help you to decrease. However, reality is only one realization. We don't have many realizations. So whenever you are giving a, a, a vaccine to someone, that's not necessary or to, I don't know, whatever, a number N of people, you cannot ensure that this will for sure decrease the number of infection in a later time. This is basically the, the message and which I find counterintuitive. And there is, um, and that can be easily explained. Okay, now I move to flocking models. And with that, uh, lately had me, uh, Parisa Ramani has been helped me, has helped me with that. Here, what I'm showing you is uh, that the, these particles move through a model that is called the Vicek model. And if I manage to do this, please let me know if you see this. Um, I will show you um, where is this thing. So this is the dynamics. You see my screen? Yeah. yeah. OK, so here is uh, we started with all susceptible agents and there are a few here and they are moving in this way. This is what does the, the big check model and we are looking at the disease that is spreading in there. That's all. OK, so <clears throat> in here what you have is um, then two, two situations. If the, the one parameter that is a noise is very strong, the system will be disordered. If that noise is, is low, you can go to an order phase, basically where everybody was moving in the same direction. The movie I show you was done by, by Parisa Ramani. And, and here what we can compare is the dynamics, what happens in a point here where the system is well ordered, and here where the system is disordered. And, and, and we, we, are, we are interested in here in understanding how this affects the uh, spreading or the critical exponents associated to, to, um, to one of these SIRS or SIR um, epidemic model. And basically, this is what I'm showing you here. This is for different noise values, and there is um, this transition between the absorbing phase and the active phase. And, and basically, the message is that if you do in this point, close to the critical point, so now what you can use to, to play with the critical point is one of the parameters of the epidemics, for example, the um, what would be the probability of getting the disease when you get in contact with one of the agents, or that could be to I, the time you are infected, I mean, uh, before passing to recover. If you do that, you see that at the critical point, the, expo the critical exponent is almost 0 0.5 here. And on the other hand, you get something different. This one is around 0 0.8. And, and basically the message is that this is affecting the, um, the universality class of, of the model. So that's, that's, uh, that's kind of important message. So, and, and with that, um, basically with this, the message is that uh, in a flock, the disease spread faster than from Brownian particles, and that this affects the, um, the universality class. 
So the message is the universality class of the disease spreading process is strongly affected by the motility pattern of the individual. And this is not a qualitative uh, kind of effect, it's quantitative. So this is really a fundamental result. Okay, in the last minutes, uh, so what I'm going to show you is, is uh, again, it's kind of a theoretical discussion, but is why this, if you have agents moving in space, the reaction diffusion kind of models are, are, are a problem. And this is the following. Suppose that you start with a system where particles are moving on a lattice this time to make things simpler to, to be able to do some analytics. And whenever they come to the same lattice site, you, you assume that they can get infected. So that means that the, the possibility of getting the disease is, is purely local. And, and now what we want to, to understand basically is, is what happens with the reaction diffusion equation. If you would do a reaction diffusion equation, you would write the equation in this way. You have the reactions of your uh, the disease. So the, if you drop these second derivatives that are here, you are left with the, mean, the standard mean field. And that would be true and would work locally, meaning on a, on a lattice side. I mean, in, on a node in your lattice. And this one basically accounts for the motion, diffusive motion of the agent in space. However, this, is, this doesn't work. And the reason is the following. If you are very, very diluted, in principle, the, 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 the result, the critical point of this, I mean, if you want to see whether you will go to an endemic state or not, you will be comparing what happens with alpha and gamma and beta and so on. But you don't take into account D. However, what you see is that if you are very diluted, still you can get, I mean, infected if the if the infected agent or the susceptible agent meet at some point. So that means that the, that the critical value, the, the, the alpha, I mean, the, the should depend somehow, should be rescaled with the motion of, of the agent in the space. And this is basically what you can see in, in simulations. If you do simulations, you will see that there is an alpha, but there is a D, and, and you can define an effective alpha that basically allows you to, to go from the absorbing phase where there is no, no disease to the endemic phase. But again, this depends on, on, on the value of the diffusion coefficient, how quickly you are exploring the space. And, and the same happens with the endemic state. The endemic state, they depend on D. Okay, so um, the reason why the, the reaction diffusion fails is because it neglects fluctuations. Basically, we assume that that equation is valid, but they, they, we are throwing away fluctuations, fluctuations that come in the reaction that may, may have variation, as well as spatial correlations. And we have, well, the collision duration and counter times and so on. And, and to, if we want to understand a system like that, what you can do is you can write the, the master equation associated to the system. And this one, in principle, contains all the information and should be able to give us the correct answer. But as you can see, you can write it, but it's a nightmare, so you cannot do much with that. So, but, but still, you can try to use some tricks and some tricks from statistical physics, uh, in fact, from, from quantum mechanics, and this is called the Doipelletti formalism. And then you can use the, um, what is called uh, this operator of, creation and destruction, and then you could you will use them basically to recreate how particles move in space. You will use it as well to write reactions. Once you have done all that, you can put it in a kind of Schrodinger-like equation, defining uh, something like a Hamiltonian of the system, and you will construct the action of the system. And then once you have that, in principle, you should be able to obtain the correct answer. The problem is that that would require you to be able to do all these kind of integrals that are many, and, and the question is how you would perform that calculation. And in order to do that, you may think of expressing those integrals with Feynman diagrams, 
that that again you don't know how many of them or which one of them you should pick up and so on and and again here we have done some some sums of oops of these diagrams and and if you do it in a correct way and you use some intuition you get something that gives um, a reasonable correction which is this effective alpha that i'm showing you here and there is something much simpler that you can do is to at least consider the duration of a collision and the impact in the spreading of the disease that is what i'm showing you here not entering into the detail how you do but that you can do also this and if you do this you get this 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 is the doipeletti correction and this is the collision duration approximation and both of them take into account the d but again if you would go with the classical mean field or the if you want the uh, the reaction diffusion equation you your result would be this horizontal line but as you can see these dots are the simulations and uh, you are really far away from i mean this is bad description so the others are are much better and correct what is happening there meaning that what happens in space cannot be reduced to reaction diffusion equations due to fluctuations and correlations okay this is basically what i just said and and i thank you Thanks, uh, uh, Fernando, for this very nice and detailed discussion. <coughs> yeah, I will open the floor for questions. <coughs> Anybody has questions? Uh, je suis à la conférence. Fille. <laughs> you can yes, answer the screen for us. Yes, I'm trying to do that again. I'm, I'm getting a bit... Um, um, can you help me with that? Why is, oh yeah, I, I see this. I, I, yeah. yeah no. So I see you, yeah. Yeah, great. So yeah, I think Gonga, Paul, you can ask if you have a question. I have. Ganga Paul, you want to ask? Yeah. I found you pretty. Yeah. You can ask. You have to unmute yourself to ask. We cannot perhaps do it here. So, so uh, yeah, before uh, he, he comes out, I want to ask you one question. So, so this was very interesting to see that vaccination uh, necessarily doesn't mean uh, uh, that the number of cases will go down. Mm -hmm. And that we have seen perhaps in Chile, we have seen that has happened, that there was a lot of vaccination going on, still the cases went up. Mm -hmm. so, so is it to do with the strategy of vaccination to stop this? No, I mean, I, I mean, this is, is um, at the beginning I was assuming that it was a mistake or something. Then I realized that what, what happens is that um, obviously if you go to look at data or reality, there are many things that may may be involved, right? Because I think when when that's why I was rather playing a cautious game of doing just theory, playing with with the models and theory, because when if you go with the data and you start to vaccinate, people may feel overconfident that uh, they are protected and and so on, and and the behavior may change. If you forget about that, however, I mean, and you put it in the model where you control everything, what happens is, well, that's why I call it the, basically the, the, this time machine that you can go and repeat exactly the same experiment with, but, but for instance, with one extra immune agent. And then one, in this immune agent that you added into the system triggers, uh, I mean, an outbreak that you were not expecting, right? I mean, there is one agent that cannot transmit that should help. However, what happens is this is a, is, is a problem with three agents that you can understand is that 
basically what is affecting is the timestamps at which this occurs. And if one agent, that agent that we have uh, vaccinated, were supposed to transmit the disease uh, before to a group of people or to someone that this someone transmitted to some someone else, then what happens is that someone else may may reach the group that we're going to suppose go to a meeting and infect everybody. But if that person that is going to infect everybody in, in that uh, party was getting the disease days before, and or either is um, that basically may never reach the disease in infected, and and for that you will you you understand what I'm trying to say. So you this is affecting the timestamps in which you get the infection, and that that may allow a, 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 an agent or group of agents to to basically pass the disease. It's, it's a fully let's say deterministic kind of, of process in the sense that by varying at which point you have infected agents, you, you can increase that number. Yeah, is, you understand a bit the idea? Yeah. Uh, a bit, yeah. Abir, you want to ask a question? I see your hands up. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, I have a question that may push this a bit forward. So how can you tackle the virus mutations into your model? The, the what? The mutation of the virus? Yeah, I mean, if it like, you know, it is a parallel dynamics, maybe it's slow, but, uh, uh, you know, the scale of uh, the scale of infection is such uh, large nowadays that, you know, the effective dynamics are now almost in sync. So you cannot really neglect that. So how do you? No, can, sure. I mean, th this you can probably assume that there is a, either at the modeling level, you can always go in a direction where the inf the the number of infected people, for example, could go down. Um, basically, the pool of susceptible is getting smaller, but you could assume that the alpha, for example, gets is increased or stochastically could go up, and then you can take into account into the model. But basically, my my point of the the um, of the talk is that there is something that so far is almost unexplored. I mean, there was a lot of resistance to even think about that, is what is the, the impact of mobility and short scale at short scale in space, short scale even in time. So basically how, how motion affects um, the spreading of a disease. This is kind of a niche. We, we need to know how, what, how to control that. And there is something that I have not mentioned, but basically is that the density of people may be way less important than the way people move. That means you can be fully packed and that not may be such a problem as if you are just exchanging your neighbors. And that could happen in an airport, that could happen in the street, that could happen in a train station as people try to go. So knowledge on, on how um, motion affect the spreading at these scales needs to be understood and keeps on being neglected by looking at larger scales, a longer times and, and and I think this this needs to be understood. There is from a fundamental reason to understand that. I mean, from playing the theoretical games, I think it's interesting, but also from a practical point of view, and um, and that is I I, I think uh, well we, we we need to understand we we uh, and if that wouldn't affect people, then the confinement where we were enforced. To stay at home shouldn't have an effect, and this is not for large-scale transportation. It was not that you cannot leave the city, you cannot leave your home, and that has helped, right? So mm -hmm. we need to understand how human motion at these scales, pedestrian motion, for example, affect the spreading of the disease. So, uh, do you think that uh, this model can help design any principled intervention strategy? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I was trying to push the idea that this could be used to, for example, design train stations, shopping malls, and so on, and not beyond COVID. I mean, we know that we will have another one, and we have always viruses around, and there is ways that you can try to say you can design spaces in such a way that the pedestrian flow may not at least uh, promote the spreading of this. And again, I say again, the, the, there was everybody basically bought the idea that 
what you have to do is, for example, in a room, put or uh, I mean, in some space, control the density. Density is an important factor. I do agree, but the motion exchanging your neighbor could lead to much an increase. I mean, could be way more important than density, and that has been remarkably overlooked. Nobody even thought about that. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, in fact, this is a very old work that we started to push around and we, we, we have troubles to convince people that this is an important aspect. We should not all see at the large scales and all be focused on the same, at the same scale, same type of question. There's some niche here that we need to, to understand. Okay, um, great, great. So I will, in the interest of time, just one last question, Mekha, just. Yeah, uh, thanks, Fernando, for a great talk. Um, I was just wondering if it's possible or if it's useful to also model super spreaders in your model, because the timestamps of super spreaders would be the most important ones. So yes, on yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are two things that we will look in with super spreaders. One was the in, in one of the heterogeneous population, we use agents with a, a speed that was power law distributed, power law with a cutoff in such a way that we were trying to keep the average um, number, I mean, the, the average speed that is going to give you in the context of this model, the average degree of the agents comparable. But um, but you are right. I mean, the super, um, the, there are two things that you can call, super, I mean, super whatever. So mm -hmm. what you can do is you can play with super diffusion in here. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically let agents to perform uh, levy walks, or if you mm -hmm. want levy flights, that have a strong impact on the dynamics because that may connect different places. I mean, you see someone that starts, I mean, like a drop of agents that start to get infected and someone that make a jump may produce a seed in another place. So it has a, a huge impact on the spreading. And the other one that uh, has a very important, I mean, strong impact is the fact that having as you said, super spreader, that you can model that as assuming that agents that move much faster or have a larger contact rate than others. And if you want, I mean, I, I mean, we wouldn't, if you want to connect it to applications, I think that in space, there are some people that may be sources of being super spreader that may not necessarily move. Suppose if you have someone at the entrance of a building um, like could be the, I mean, doing whatever, or the, the, I mean, a bus driver, this kind of guys will get in contact, close contact with a lot of people passing. So I guess the chances that they, they will get the disease and eventually pass the disease are much higher than uh, regular people, right? And uh, this, this becomes super oh, yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando, for the great talk and the insights you are giving. I'm just wondering whether I should take lift or not. So whether that would that motion is good or not. Anyway, this is just a joke I'm telling. Yeah. So thank you.